Okay. I think we're ready. Hello, everyone, and welcome to, to today's webinar, Findings and Recommendations for Corn Belt Farmers. My name is Jan Voigt, and I'll be your moderator. I've had the privilege of being a member of the Extension Team for the Sustainable Corn Project, and I'm really excited to be part of this session today. The Sustainable Corn Project is funded by a grant from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The project began in 2011 and convened teams from 10 land-grant universities in the Corn Belt. Our speakers will present findings and recommendations of this unique five-year research project. Topics include cover crops, tillage management, drainage water management, extended crop rotations, farmer adaptation, and conservation practice adoption. There are a few housekeeping items to cover quickly before we get started. Today's webinar is being recorded. It will be accessible through the same link you're using now. We'd also love to hear from you during today's presentations. So we'll have time for questions after each session is completed. And please write your questions in the chat box as you think of them. And then there will also be time at the very end for the presentations for more questions. And Lori, do you have any further instructions? Yeah, thanks, Jan, and for leading and organizing this webinar. Just a comment to all participants that all lines have been muted by myself um, centrally. So um, that's just to retain audio quality. At any time, you can unmute your individual line using star six, and that will unmute, and then you can remute mute your line using star six again. So just remember that star six back and forth will unmute and mute your line. So we'll have time for questions later and you can ask that way or you can also type in the chat box and um, we'll address questions at that point. So if you have any problems at all with your audio or connection, um, simply type in the chat box and myself or Suresh Lakande, who's helping to host this um, meeting can address and help you in that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Lori. And lastly, we'd like to encourage you to share this information with your peers and direct them to the recording. And for those of you just joining, welcome to the session, Findings and Recommendations for Corn Belt Farmers. Let's get started with our first presentation. Eileen Kladuko, Purdue University, is here to provide information about cover crops. Eileen is a professor of agronomy at Purdue, where she teaches and does research and extension work in soil physics, soil biology, and soil management. Her research studies over the past 32 years have included cover crops, soil health, earthworms, no-till, drainage, and water. Her overall research focus has been to identify soil management systems that improve environmental quality and promote agricultural sustainability. Eileen? OK, thank you, Jan. Thank you, everybody. Um, glad to be uh, leading off on this session this afternoon to give everybody some idea of some of the results that we've been able to obtain on our um, five-year multi-state project. So, I'm going to be speaking about cover crops uh, on behalf of the field and modeling teams that have worked on cover crops during this time period. So uh, before I start talking about results, I do want to talk a little bit about the context and, and some background material related to cover crops. Um, so the first thing I, I like for all of us to uh, think about is why are we even talking about cover crops as we look at uh, ways to improve resilience of our corn-based cropping systems in the Midwest? Well, the, the basic rationale is to have a, a living and growing plant at times of the year that we typically don't have a living and growing plant in, in the Midwest. Um, by having a, a growing plant, it, it's capturing sunlight, photosynthesizing, putting carbon into the soil, feeding the soil organisms, uh, sequestering carbon, trapping and recycling nutrients, um, improving soil quality or soil health. And basically just making better use of the time and resources that we have available 
um, than we typically do if we just have a four to five month summer um, annual crop. So I'd like you to think about for just a moment um, what is what is your main reason or what would be your main purpose for growing cover crops for you um, individually in your farm operation. Um, it might be to reduce erosion. That's kind of a classic reason for using cover crops. Maybe it's to scavenge residual nitrogen left in the soil profile. Or maybe you're looking to produce or fix nitrogen for next year's cash crop. Maybe your main purpose is to build soil health or to control weeds or a number of other purposes that folks have for growing cover crops. So the, the first thing people need to think about is why do I want to grow a cover crop and then that may help me select the cover crop or mixture of cover crops that I would like to use. So choosing your cover crop to meet your main purposes is what I usually encourage people to, you know, to think about when they first get into this. Okay, no one cover crop does does everything equally well. Um, but then the, uh, the next question is, oh man, there are a lot of interesting cover crops to choose from, so where do I start? So I'm going to start by just reviewing some of the main cover crops that people are currently using um, in the Midwest. And the, the grasses, um, oats and cereal rye and annual ryegrass, are some pretty common cover crops that, that people are using. Uh, certainly there are others, winter barley, winter tritic triticale. Um, the next group is, is the brassicas. Uh, the daikon radish shown here is one of the more popular ones right now, uh, but certainly turnips. Um, people have been using turnips for, for a while, especially if they um, have cattle. Um, the uh, uh, mustard or the rapeseed are some other brassicas that, that people may use as cover crops. And then the legumes, uh, the ones people are looking at now include crimson clover and Austrian winter pea and hairy vetch, and of course the old standby red clover that many people have used in wheat systems or in uh, forage-based systems for many years. So these are the three main categories of cover crops that people are using and, and just an idea of some of the more common ones that are being used in the region at the moment. So the sustainable corn team is used or studied cereal rye. So why did we study cereal rye when there's all these other um, more exciting cover crops to look at? Well, we used it in part because it's the most winter hardy of all the cover crops. Um, and since we had um, experiments going on stretching from Ohio to Missouri up to Minnesota, uh, we wanted something that would be widely adaptable. So yes, cereal rye is probably the most widely adaptable uh, cover crop that we have. Um, it does have management challenges, though. So we didn't use it because it was the easiest one to use. Um, there are management challenges, and I will talk about a few of those a little bit later on. But basically, we decided we wanted one cover crop that could fit across the whole region for this particular uh, study on what does a cover crop do to yields and to soil properties. So again, if we look at what the main purposes for growing cover crops might be and how the cereal rye stack up, uh, cereal rye is excellent for reducing erosion, um, scavenging residual nitrogen, building soil health, controlling weeds. Um, it does not produce or fix nitrogen. It's a grass, not a legume, so it doesn't do anything for uh, building more nitrogen other than scavenging residual nitrogen that, that's in the soil profile, which is a, a very um, important use for cereal rye. I also want to stress that cover crops are part of a system. There are different potential benefits and challenges for each type of cover crop that we have. Um, and whenever anybody starts integrating cover crops, they need to um, adapt their entire cropping system. So that means you need to look at your nutrient management, your tillage or no tillage management, um, how you handle manure if you have it, pest management, crop rotation. Um, and there is a learning curve for using cover crops. Um, you need to do your homework. This applies whether you're a farmer, an extension person, a, a conservation agency person, or a researcher. Uh, there's a definite learning curve to, to using cover crops. Um, and, and we strongly encourage people to take advantage of resources available out there, including farmers in the local area that have used them, uh, workshops and extension meetings, and um, webinars such as this one. Okay, so the first challenge for integrating cover crops into your system is getting the cover crops to grow, and we're going to move into some of our uh, specific data now. 
um, but reliable establishment of the cover crop in the first place uh, in the fall and then adequate growth in the fall are often cited as challenges. So I've got two different um, pictures here of amount of cover crop growth. The one on the left, we had a pretty modest amount of growth. It was well established, but nonetheless a very modest amount of growth by mid-November in, in Indiana. And the one on the right, where the cover crop was planted much earlier, uh, quite a lot of, of growth. So just kind of illustrating the extremes that you might get. Um, this graph is illustrating one year's worth of cover crop growth data from our regional study. Um, the, I do not have the different sites labeled um, intentionally, but I just want to give an idea of the range of growth. So the brown bars are the cover crop growth after corn, the green after soybeans. Um, but what I'm illustrating, and the, the uh, vertical axis here is the rye biomass in kilograms per hectare or roughly pounds per acre. So we have growth that ranged anywhere from around two or 300 pounds per acre, not very much, to uh, biomass or top growth of over 3,000 pounds per acre, quite a lot. Um, the difference in growth varied across the region, so across these sites, um, across the cash crop, in part because we allowed the, uh, in many of these sites, we allowed the, the cover crop to grow longer after corn before soybeans, as shown here, versus after soybeans before corn. And that's one of the management practices or one of the management uh, decisions that needs to be made. Um, and the growth also varied across years. I'm only showing you 2013 here, but um, 2014 and 2015 were, were <clears throat> also all, all different. So the first finding that we might articulate in, in words is that the cereal rye cover crop growth varies widely across the region and across years. Um, this is due, first of all, to actual climate differences across the region. Uh, secondly, to weather variations in any particular year at any particular site. And then thirdly, based on specific management practices that are utilized, um, how it is seeded and uh, when it is terminated and, and so on. So the recommendations that, that come from this um, at this point in time is certainly that we need, we continue to need more innovation and research and development to improve both the practicality and the reliability of seeding and establishment. Um, there are many challenges. There is still a lot of innovation going on by researchers, by extension folks, and by farmers in this area, but we certainly need more innovation and research. And then secondly, even if it gets well established, uh, we need further development of ways to increase the amount of growth of those cover crops in the time windows that we have available in both fall and spring. Um, consistent with good management for the cash crop. So we're not saying we want to grow a lot of cover crop and no cash crop, but we want to encourage more growth of cover crop as long as we are consistent with managing our cash crop well. And we'll talk about that again in a few, a few more minutes. The second finding that we can articulate relates to the amount of nitrogen that is contained within that above ground biomass. So the total nitrogen uptake by the cereal rye cover crop um, increases as the amount of cover crop growth increases. Right? You get more production of material, you get more uptake of the nitrogen. Um, the cereal rye cover crop reduced the soil nitrate concentration in the spring, and the amount of that reduction was related to the amount of cereal rye biomass. So the cereal rye is growing, taking up nitrogen out of the soil, reducing it compared to what the control plot is that doesn't have cover crop. And the more growth you get, the greater the reduction, okay, which leads to water quality improvements. And so that's, that's uh, the, the, the good thing about that. The cereal rye cover crop also reduced soil nitrate concentrations even in the fall, even though there was not very much fall growth at most sites. Um, and this is some residual effects of the cereal rye having been there the, the previous spring. Okay, so the cereal rye takes up nitrogen, so what kind of recommendations come from that? Well, if your purpose is to scavenge more nitrogen from the soil profile so that you reduce further the potential for nitrate leaching out the bottom of the root zone, then we need to promote um, greater cover crop growth within the cover crop growth window. But there is a potential trade-off. Uh, there could be a trade-off to maximizing cover crop growth um, related to risks for corn yield. 
and we're going to talk about that momentarily. So again, we're talking about maximizing the growth within the primary cover crop window and while still maintaining proper management for our cash crop. The third finding we articulated was that um, in, in all of these studies, the soybean grain yield was not increased or decreased when planted into a winter cereal rye cover crop. And again, I point out that at almost all of these sites, um, we had years one through four of a cereal rye cover crop. So no, no effect on yield, either positive or negative, and it didn't matter how much rye growth we had or the number of days between when the rye was terminated and when we planted the soybeans. So the recommendation coming from that is basically that soybean crops can be planted uh, the same day that you terminate the rye or at any time after termination of the rye uh, without any detrimental um, effects on the yield. Corn was a little bit different. Corn yields were sometimes reduced with cereal rye cover crop. Um, greater amounts of rye biomass tended to be associated with greater corn yield reductions in some cases. Primarily, um, number one, when there was less time between when the rye was terminated and when the corn was planted. Number two, if, it was, if there were colder temperatures. Or number three, if there was greater precipitation. All three of those conditions where the rye seemed to um, uh, cause some detriment to corn yield, all three of those conditions are consistent with the concept of alleliopathy, which is basically that um, some plants exude um, compounds that tend to inhibit the growth of others. Um, and so cereal rye is one of those that sometimes shows that type of an effect. So what are the recommendations that we would have? Um, the first one is that if you're managing cereal rye before corn, um, that you need to terminate that cereal rye a minimum of two weeks ahead of corn planting and while it is still small. The Midwest Cover Crops Council, or MCCC, uh, recommends a target height of six to eight inches tall before corn. So keeping, keeping that cereal rye pretty short um, and then terminating it. What this does is it helps reduce risks from that allelopathy that I just talked about or risks from um, insects such as armyworm or nitrogen immobilization, basically giving enough time for um, those, those potential risks to um, dissipate. The other recommendation is certainly to use planting and production practices that, that help enhance early season corn growth to basically eliminate any potential corn yield penalty um, from the rye cover crop. And so what are some of those practices? Well, certainly having the corn planter adjusted properly with proper attachments to deal with uh, greater residues and you know, proper adjustments and setup. Um, some states, such as Indiana, also recommend starter nitrogen for corn when it's being planted into cereal rye or being planted no-till. So anything to basically get the corn plant up and going um, faster um, is, is helpful. Okay, just want to talk about a few a few uh, resources that are available. The Midwest Cover Crops Council, which encompasses the entire region of this project, has some resources available, including a, a pocket uh, field guide. Um, many states have extension publications related to managing cover crops. Uh, we have a couple new ones at Purdue that, that just came out uh, at the end of last summer, talking about integrating cover crops into a corn soybean rotation. And then the Midwest Cover Crops Council website is, again, a, a great resource for everybody um, in the region. It includes a selector tool, and it includes many other management tips. Okay, I'd like to talk about just a few other things. We do have other data that are being analyzed, uh, but that data has been uh, basically just coming back from the laboratory late this fall and early winter, and so we will be analyzing um, that. Soil moisture and temperature, some of the sites measured moisture and temperature in the field. Um, the hypothesis is that we have uh, greater infiltration and less evaporation, so more water availability. We'll be, we'll be um, analyzing for that. And soil organic matter, um, the hypothesis is that by having the cover crops, we have uh, protected or 
at least protected uh, against carbon losses and perhaps increase the carbon um, in the soils. The, the uh, modeling team has done quite a bit of modeling. I, I'm only briefly touching on a few main points here. Um, basically, many of the models show that the future climate is predicted to increase some of the negative environmental effects that we have um, in some situations in agriculture, like erosion, as you would see on the right-hand side of this picture here, um, and nitrate losses. And by growing a cover crop, it was able to partially offset some of those impacts by slowing the loss of soil carbon <clears throat> and reducing soil erosion. So if you're interested in cover crops or if you're already growing cover crops and interested in thinking about some other types of cover crops um, that we didn't really talk about here, um, these are the kinds of questions I encourage people to think about. Again, what is your main purpose? What is your current cropping and tillage system? What time windows do you have available? Um, how are you going to seed the cover crop? And then a whole host of specific questions. Uh, the, the lines highlighted in green here, the Midwest Cover Crops Council tool, uh, can help, help can help you with um, some of those questions. Again, the MCCC, um, if you look on the left-hand bar here, the cover crop selector tools, they're very easy to use, and they can um, help you learn about the the characteristics of different cover crops uh, very quickly and which ones might fit into your operation. So the bottom line is that cover crops may increase resilience of our systems, especially over the long term. They do pose some challenges and, and risks. There's a learning curve. Greater management is definitely needed. Um, cover crops provide water quality benefits um, downstream, and more research is certainly needed to realize their full potential in the Midwest. And with that, I am uh, done with the presentation, and I think there is time for questions, perhaps. And just a reminder that if you would like to ask questions, you can type into the chat box, or um, to unmute your line, press star six, and then you can um, speak your question. Eileen, I've heard people talking about cover crops improving soil health. Did you find that, or would you expect to find that? Well, we expect uh, the cover crops to improve soil health. Um, we are in the process of analyzing the data, really, that goes with uh, soil health. So uh, we expect it to improve uh, soil organic matter, and that is just coming back from the lab now. We expect it to um, improve water holding capacity, and, and all of those data from the last year of the project really have come in uh, very recently from the labs. And so we expect that. That's our hypothesis, but we have not yet analyzed that. Okay. There's one question in the chat box. Oh. Jan, if you want to read that. Sure. Um, to terminate the cereal rye, what equipment were you using? Uh, so for termination of the cover crops, all of the sites in this project used, used herbicide. Uh, the particular herbicides would have varied a bit um, from site to site, but all of them included um, glyphosate as at least one of, the, one of the herbicides. There are other ways to terminate um, cover crops, um, including if you let it go really long for like organic systems, you could do roller crimper, um, but in a corn soybean system, that is not normally a, uh, a practice that would be used. So herbicide was, was the primary termination method. Okay, another question is besides nitrogen, um, are you evaluating other nutrient cycles? In this particular project, no, nitrogen was the the main one. Um, I would say a few of the researchers on this project are also looking at um, some aspects of uh, phosphorus um, because of the potential for phosphorus losses in, in some parts of the watershed. But um, the main project emphasis was on nitrogen and, and not on any of the other nutrients. Okay. Um, what are the cost per acre 
for using cereal rye as a cover crop? So the costs depend, um, of course, from year to year and from where you are in the region. Um, you can cereal rye is um, one of the one of the less expensive ones in most years, not every year, um, but typically you might be talking um, twenty five to thirty dollars an acre for seed and seeding, depending on how you are seeding it. Um, it could go up to forty dollars an acre, but for cereal rye, um, thirty would normally take care of it. But again, it depends on how you're seeding it and when you get your seed and w what year it is as far as the price of cereal rye seed. Okay, um, we are just about out of time, so and I know there are other questions, so we'll either address those at the end or or answer them afterwards after we're all done. Um, so if Rick is our next speaker. Okay. So I guess I guess that's my sign, Jan, to uh, to start up. Sure, you can you can start unless you want me to give you an introduction. But I can you can just go if you're ready. <laughs> no, I don't need. It. I'll give my own introduction because you probably wouldn't do it right. Don't take oh, that. Oh, there, that's time. probably true. <laughs> yeah, I'll introduce myself as the world's second best fisherman. Now the standard question is why second best? Well, the answer is in most crowds, whenever I introduce myself as the best, there's a fight. Uh, second best is pretty good, so I'm willing to take that. Hey, welcome, everybody. I appreciate the opportunity. And uh, as I go through here, at the end, what we want to do, we'll spend a little bit of time kind of like I, Eileen did, and Eileen, you did a very nice job of uh, discussing why relative to tillage and why tillage might influence crop performance and yield. And then we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, comparing yields for corn in a corn-soybean system soybeans in the soybean corn system or corn soybean system, and then corn in continuous corn across five states in this project and across five different years. So anyway, let's, uh, let's talk first about uh, why tillage uh, may even be important. I think the first thing, <coughs> excuse me, to, is to understand that, you know, the, the corn plant or the soybean plant really doesn't care what kind of tractor you have. It doesn't care what your tire pressure is. It doesn't care whether your machinery is green, blue. What it really responds to is the environment that you create underground. You can't influence what happens above ground, but based on the management practices you use, you, use, you can influence what the root system of the plant experiences. I like to use the acronym WANTS to help people remember what they're managing when they consider or use a different tillage, tillage system. The W is for water. Plants have to have water. What you do influences the soil water content. They have to have air. How many times have you seen, and corn is probably the most prevalent crop where you see this, a corn plant standing in water after a heavy rain, but the plant is wilting. The plant root system must have oxygen to take up water and nutrients. In the absence of oxygen or air, the plant membrane simply can't work. The end in wants is for nutrients, fertility, how you apply, how much you apply, where you apply. So temperature. Temperature influences a variety of things happening underground, from conversion of nitri nitrogen fertilizers to nitrate, decomposition of organic matter, uh, affects how cover crops grow, affects how roots of crops grow. And do we change temperature by changing tilling systems? Yes, we do. And the yes is for strength. You know, I said tire pressure doesn't make any difference. Well, tire pressure does make a difference as it influences the amount of application pressure that's applied to soils which in turn can influence strength or compaction. That factor is also influenced by the soil water content at the time that you apply those pressures. Okay, so we're going to go through a little bit of a quiz exercise here for you, for everyone. Now, this is a true-false question. 
Reducing tillage results in higher soil water content. I know you can't respond in this venue. Uh, each of you should have an answer. In general, that answer is true. It's true because, because the residues on the soil surface reflect solar radiation to a greater extent than do bare soils. Soil radiation drives the evaporation process. Many of us think that the residue acts kind of as a as a uh, an insulator. Well, it, it acts a little bit as an insulator, but the biggest factor is the reflection of the solar radiation, so that that radiation is not available to heat the soil surface. How much radiation does it take to evaporate? I'll use a gram. A gram is a small amount, much less than an ounce, compared to raising the temperature of that one gram of water. It takes one calorie to raise one gram of water one degree centigrade. For comparison, it takes 539 calories to evaporate water, one gram of water. So you see the impact of that residue and reflection, reflecting uh, radiation is, is critical and is important. And there's one other factor, and this is a big one. When you till the soil, you break the connection between particles, soil particles in the subsoil layer and that on the soil surface. Water moves from particle to particle as water is transferred from the, the subsoil layer to the soil surface. So when you don't till, you have a continuous hydraulic connection that will allow water to move to the surface when water on the surface is evaporated. So it's a combination of the residue and uh, reflecting radiation and the ability of, of soils that are untilled to move water towards the soil surface. Soil temperature residues increase or decrease soil temperature. Well, I think everyone probably got that one right, but they should. Residues tend to decrease soil temperature. Why do you suppose that is? You remember the last slide we talked about residues reflecting solar radiation? Residues typically reflect, and it varies upon residue type and, and the age of that residue, but they typically reflect uh, half or more. Yeah, they, they re, let, me, let me say it in a different way. They reflect two times the amount of radiation as does bare soil. Bare soil absorbs more energy. Energy heats soil. Surfaces that do not have surface residue absorb more radiation. The radiation is available to warm the soil surface. Most of those that deal with tillage understand when residues cover the soil surface, soil temperatures tend to be lower. The soil strength or compaction. Soil strength increases as tillage intensity decreases. Soil strength is synonymous with compaction. This one is not quite so easy to answer. It's not so easy to answer for a couple of reasons. And we'll go through those reasons. Sometimes the answer is true, sometimes it's not. It depends upon where you traffic, whether you control your traffic when you don't till, things of that nature, how wet it is when you track. Okay, what we have on the screen here is, is an example of root growth responding to different compaction patterns that might exist for two different tillage systems. On the left-hand side, try to sketch a diagram of what we might have as a, as a tillage pan. You know, tillage pans in the Midwest typically are not so hard or so impermeable that plant roots can't pass through. Mm -hmm. Was I supposed to advertise something that I didn't? <laughs> it's okay. Uh, but so we do have we do have a tillage pan that restricts root growth to some extent, yet roots can still grow through. Roots will concentrate above that pan. See, plant roots are genetically programmed to produce a given size root system, 
and they tend to produce that root system in the part of the root zone that's most favorable for root growth. Now, if we go to the right and we have a, a, a tractor traffic compaction zone, which is more vertical rather than horizontal, where do we typically would we find root growth there? It would be to the side of the plant where that compaction uh, did not exist. Did root growth drop in those areas? No, but it sure is reduced. It does have influences about fertilizer placement as well. Okay, so what I'm going to try to show you in the next three slides is what actually happens when these when crop when corn is growing growing in soils in which we have placed a compaction plant. The first set of slides come from a box in which we grew corn roots for about uh, I think this was about two months. There was no compaction in though in that box. Now the next two slides I'm going to show you within the box we had a a horizontal pan somewhat like we would expect with tillage, base, base of a disc, or more mobile plow if you're still plowing. Or we had tractor induced tan, plant, uh, compaction area. Okay, based on this rooting pattern, where would you expect, what type of a compacted area would you anticipate existed? Now let's contrast that. If you look at the next one and you have a better idea. In this trial, it's fairly easy to see, to tell where compaction existed. Was it so strong the roots could not penetrate? No. But it was sufficiently strong to reduce root growth rates, which then allows root growth to be encouraged in the zone, in this case above that pan, to a greater extent. Okay, so which one of those roots do you suppose weighed the most? Of those? Of those three treatments, which weighed more? Let me give you a hint. Which weighs more, this or this? In reality, independent of the treatment we imposed, the root weights were not different. They were the same. So the take-home message <coughs> is this. Well, let, let, I'll, I'll back up a bit. Let's uh, one more, one more pass. Uh, and no-till requires uniform residue distribution. Is that true or false? Most of you recognize this as a trash whipper. Those soils, soils are untilled if the residue has been moved, which will influence the zones where it's warmer and drier. So not a tilling, no-till is not created equal. Different individuals may have different management practices, and it will show up in the no-till response to the, to the crop plants. By and large, most conventional tillage systems are fairly uniform between operators. So now I'm to the take-home slide. Then we'll get into the data. With conventional tillage, homogeneity dominates. If you take a measurement, 1 point, 2 point, 3 points, 4 points, as long as it's at the same depth, you're going to get about the same Thing, whether you're dealing with water, air, temperature. However, with no-till, depending upon how the farmer or producer manages, there's a lot of different of different measurements that you will see in, in this soil environmental acronym you use, want. All no-till is not created the same. Okay, so now let's move on to, uh, to data. Now, I'm going to show you three slides, and if I was on the podium in front of you, I'd get booed off the podium simply because of the amount of information in the slides, but I'm going to try to help you walk through. What we have, we have no-till versus a conventional tillage form, and the conventional tillage form is, is some form of typically a chisel plow. All of these trials are not exactly the same because some of these were started before this project that is supporting this webinar started. And when these projects started in the different states, people did not communicate or hadn't communicated across boundaries with a desire to make them the same. So the thing that is common among these is conventional tillage of some form and a no-till management scheme. Okay, and the next thing you see is we're making comparisons, and we put the slide up here, from Trials that were conducted in five different states, Illinois, Iowa, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. 
at a couple different sites in in uh, a couple of the states. The other thing that's important is we are making estimates across the five-year period, 2009 to 2013. So when you make the combinations of different tillage practices, conventional till and no-till, across five different states, the level of complexity becomes a, it can, difficult to uh, convey succinctly in a single slide presentation. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you the summary results of this, and we're going to try to draw a conclusion about whether or not no-till responds differently than conventional till across years and across locations. Okay, so in this, one other thing I need to mention, well, first of all, somebody's already seen it, there's a typo in here when you're standing in front of a group or talking to a group and you missed a typo, it's not a good feeling, but nonetheless, this is a corn yield in a corn soybean sequence. Okay, so let's go to the far right column. We're going to average the corn yields across all sites for each of the years. If what is highlighted in this column are the significant differences between tillage systems. The upper block is conventional till. The lower block of numbers is no-till. Any two numbers within a given year that have a common letter are not different when we run the stat test on the data. The yellow signs here indicate that in 2012, which tillage system performed best across all sites, of the years there was not a difference. Okay, so let's, let's look at something different. This is the uh, corn you, uh, you go down one more. This is the soybean yield in the corn soybean sequence. Again, let's go to the right-hand column. The only year in which there was a difference when averaged across states was 2010. In 2010, no-till performed better. Now, if we had time, we'd look at individual states and the different tillage systems, and there's some interesting things happening. Not all states are created equally either. Okay, let's go to the next one, which is going to be corn yield in the continuous corn system. Again, where we have highlighted numbers in comparing the tillage systems within a given year, average across all states. And these are in bushel spray, or some of these smaller numbers that you see are in the metric system, but I've converted those metric numbers to uh, English units, which uh, help understand. And I hope everybody is uh, seeing something different than I am right now. I'm not. Uh, I don't. I don't have anything up. So let let me uh, try to summarize finally. What uh, what what come out of that one? When we have no-till and continuous corn, we typically see corn yields higher with conventional tillage, and that's across basically all states, all locations. However, the one year in which no-till outperformed the conventional tillage was in 2012. Okay, I'm going to quickly, uh, time for questions, I want to pop on just a couple, couple uh, recommendations. Uh, our no-till management tended to stabilize yields compared to conventional tillage. No-till also performed better for corn and for soybeans in the warmer, drier environment that year, particularly 2012. Okay, questions? In southern Minnesota, farmers say they till to dry the soil out and warm it up. That's why they're scared to go out no-till and plant cover crops. They want to get into the field early, not later. Absolutely. Is that a question or a comment? I don't know. I guess that's just a comment. That's, okay. Um, 
And we then uh, can you elaborate on the water quality benefits of the study? Sure, sure. Uh, water quality of benefits of the study, uh, typically uh, my comments on those are going to be marginal. Any system in which we have greater leaching through the profile and uh, higher nitrogen rates will give us challenges relative to the nitrate loss in tile lines. The loss, and we did this was not part of the study, but I can tell you this, uh, anything that reduces sediment movement will reduce a component of the phosphorus loss. No-till soil loss is, is lower soil conservation with no-till is, is greater. So from the phosphorus side, it's, it's beneficial. Okay. Uh, will no-till solve our soil erosion and water quality problems? Absolutely not. Uh, No-till is a component of the system necessary to keep soils in place and keep water quality improved. Uh, No-till alone will not work. We often see people that have used no-till have done so because they've had uh, the access of, of ground up rate GMO technology. On a variety of farms, many fields, we've seen uh, grass waterways removed. No-till looks good, but uh, but no-till looks good because the Brussels technology where we estimate soil erosion considers only sheet and rill. It doesn't include the added ephemeral gully loss that occurs due to due to the loss of grass waterways. No-till is good. It's very good. It's a component of the system, the cover crops, grass waterways, crop diversity are also critical components. All right. Um, how are we to promote cover crops and soil health with the farmers that, obvious, that may not want to have anything to do with this? And can you ask the next question, Janet, or Jan? No, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think the, the, best, the best way of doing that is example. Uh, it's difficult for farmers, and I totally understand that, to take a recommendation from someone who sits in the ivory tower like myself, Eileen, uh, others that are going to be part of this. But uh, talk to farmers that have made it work. There are examples where this works, and it works because it can work. Too often we think of reasons why it can't. In reality, those that are successful are successful because they they want to make it work. Now, there's a fear. Absolutely, there's a fear. I mean, your livelihood depends upon it. But uh, you give it a whirl. Talk to, talk to people that have been successful and try to emulate their success. Okay. Um, we have a, a less than a minute, but I have one more. How can cover yeah. crops benefit them more than tilling? Cover crops uh, have the opportunity of producing live biomass underground. And uh, the, the benefit from tilling, how to, I'm, you know, you, tilling warms and dries the soil. Cover crops have a better opportunity in improving your soil health. Working with them both together, you have the greatest amount of benefit. I, don't, I wouldn't put one against the other. They're both part. The, the no-till and the cover crops are part of a successful system. Jan, by the way, I don't know if you were, I don't have connection and have lost connection a couple, three times during this event. Yeah, thanks, Rick. This is Lori. I did notice that we lost about 20 people all at one point um, on the visual. So if you're on the audio line and can't see it, go ahead and try and re-log back in or click on that link. Um, that was... Um, on the external website, the sustainablecorn.org website, and come back in. I'm not sure what happened. Um, everything on our end looks okay, so give it a try again. Okay. Hey, no, appreciate it. Flying blind is not easy, but it's been done before. Emilia Gerhardt did that, right? Well, thank you yeah. for, for being able to do it that way. Um, I, we're ready for Jeff Strzok next. Um, he will address the topic of drainage water management. Jeff is a professor of soil and soil scientist at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Soil, Water, and Climate. He's located at the Southwest Research and Outreach Center near Lamberton. 
His research and outreach education program focuses on agricultural drainage, water and nutrient management in agricultural systems, addressing production needs, and quantifying mitigating negative off-site environmental impacts. So, Jeff? Thanks, Jan. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. So, uh, like Jan said, uh, I've, I've actually been part of a team um, of researchers uh, with the, uh, the corn cap project, uh, working with controlled drainage, drainage water management uh, kinds of issues. And there is a really nice um, thread that kind of runs through some of the things that, that Rick was talking about and, and complementary to some of the things that I'm going to talk about. And, and that is, is really when Rick was talking about uh, the plants need oxygen. And so uh, you'll, you'll see that theme kind of come up here um, as, I go through my, uh, as I go through my presentation. Um, First, uh, first thing I want to do is uh, just give some acknowledgments uh, because, you know, the, the first one is actually someone who's not actually on the list, and that's that's uh, the leadership of, of Lois Wright Morton, uh, who was the project director for the for this corn cap project, um, and without her uh, help and support, and certainly all of my colleague uh, participant collaborator researchers on the left side of that screen. Um, we wouldn't have been able to, to try to uh, measure and accomplish some of the things that we did as part of this project. So um, you know, I'm, I'm representing a whole bunch of other people. Uh, hopefully I'll, I'll do that well. And then, you know, very lastly on there, you know, like, like Rick said, you know, sometimes um, we researchers, you know, we've got our, a lot of balls in the air. And if it weren't for our technicians, grad students, postdocs, uh, you know, a lot of this work wouldn't get done. So uh, a great appreciation goes to them. The map that you see on the right-hand side of the slide there uh, basically shows the, the six locations where we had uh, drainage water management research sites. So they were scattered across the Corn Belt from the, from the eastern part of the Corn Belt there in Ohio uh, and Indiana uh, over to uh, Minnesota, Iowa, and uh, into Missouri. So one of the things that I, I thought I'd start out with is, uh, you know, just a little bit of drainage 101, um, and you know, why why do we drain uh, in the first place? And and this kind of goes back a, a little bit to what Rick was talking about, plants needing oxygen. So um, generally speaking, we we really get inadequate aeration, so we don't have enough oxygen in some of these poorly drained waterlogged soils. So some of these these heavier texture soils that we have. Uh, across the upper Midwest. Uh, highly, highly productive soils, uh, but from our perspective, they need a little help uh, to optimize the, the productivity of the corn or the soybean crops um, that might be growing out there. Now, drainage uh, in and of itself does not drain all of the water from a soil profile. It, it mainly drains away the gravitational water or the, the easily drainable uh, water that uh, is out there uh, in a, in a Particular farm field, so you know these are these are real reasons why we drain, and, and drainage has been going on for for 150 years, um, for 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 not just agricultural purposes, but uh, for infrastructure, roads, buildings, bridges, those kinds of things. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to sugarcoat this, so we're going to talk initially here a little bit about the potential benefits of some drainage, uh, and then some of the negative consequences that. Uh, that we are aware of and that we try to address with our research. So some of the potential benefits there you see on the left-hand side, uh, we can have under certain circumstances uh, reduced soil erosion. So generally speaking, uh, when we have a, the upper part of a soil profile um, that uh, because it has some drain tile in it um, might tend to be a bit drier, it has a higher capacity to absorb water uh, when we have rainfall events that potentially can reduce surface runoff. Um, as Rick kind of alluded to, you know, we can have situations because of drainage for earlier seeding dates and, and a bit more flexibility uh, for farmers um, to be able to use different tillage systems, for example, um, depending on where you're at uh, in the corn belt. Um, we know that 
better aeration, warmer soils, uh, we get better seed germination and establishment. And this is critically important, especially for corn production, uh, the further west and particularly the further north that you get um, in, in northern parts of Iowa and southern parts of Minnesota. Um, seed germination and establishment and, and the appropriate soil conditions for that to happen are, are critically, critically important. But drainage isn't only something that we think about for uh, the establishment of a crop and, and something that we think about, well, only it's, it's only important during the early part of the growing season. Um, we know that uh, for plant vigor and for plant growth uh, and, and healthiness of the plants, and of course, uh, you know, the, the yield component is also important, that we do have better plant growth when we have drainage. And some of this plant growth um, is, is seen later in the growing season. And Rick kind of alluded to the fact that, you know, sometimes we have had um, excess precipitation at times or very frequent uh, precipitation where we get uh, areas of fields or entire fields that are there, there's water ponded in them. And we can see some negative effects on the crops. Uh, corn is a little bit more resilient than soybeans. Soybeans really don't like to have wet feet, but um, having adequate drainage uh, in a field uh, throughout the growing season is is quite important. Um, but as one of my mentor or one of my uh, one of my mentors um, told me one time, uh, Dr. Wayne Skaggs, we don't really want to drain any more than we need to. And so this is part of the concept when we we get a little further along and talking about drainage and control drainage, uh, a principle that we're trying to uh, to think about. And in some places, uh, particularly uh, west of of uh, the area that we're currently doing research in, um, drainage does have the potential benefit for reducing salinity under irrigated conditions or uh, in drier conditions where salts uh, tend to be um, detrimental to crop production. Now the data on the right hand side of the screen is a, um, is a histogram of crop yields uh, for uh, a cornfield where previous to having some drainage in there was no drain pipe in this field. And when you look at that histogram, uh, the, the main area to look at is where the peak of the, uh, of the um, yield is. So the green bars, uh, the, the main uh, median part of that is yields around 150 bushels uh, per acre. Uh, and that's with no drainage, and that's quite respectable. Um, however, uh, by the investment of the drain pipe uh, in the field, um, the, this particular producer uh, was actually able to modify how that histogram looked, um, narrowed it up, tightened it up a bit, uh, and actually was able to achieve uh, a higher yield and less variability within that yield across the field um, by about 10 to 15 bushels per acre. Um, so there are some, some uh, agronomic uh, as well as, in this particular case, some economic uh, benefits to having the drainage out in the field. Of course, as I said, uh, you know, it's not all a panacea. We do know that we have some potential drawbacks. Uh, we are very aware um, of the nutrients that are dissolved uh, in that nitrogen. We hear stories in the media quite frequently about uh, um, the Gulf of Mexico and the hypoxic zones that are there in, in, in different places throughout the world. And um, in the last couple of years, we've heard about some of the phosphorus issues that they've had in Lake Erie. and, and um, so nutrients uh, dissolved in that water stream can be a bit of a problem. And so we need to think progressively and, and how can we maintain those nutrients in the field so that the farmer can take advantage of them for crop production and not contribute to uh, water quality and environmental quality problems. There are other uh, potential uh, contaminants that can get into the water stream, sediments, pesticides, uh, sometimes you know, maybe on a field or a small watershed, the hydrologic responses can be altered uh, potentially by having drainage systems uh, in a field. This is a, a diagram and a, and a photograph of some, some subsurface drainage. Now, the, the, the photograph is actually uh, one of our research fields here in Minnesota where um, this field actually was relatively flat, but it had a uniform slope. Um, and so in order to be able to use the practice of controlled drainage in this field, uh, we actually had to break this field up into four management zones. Uh, you can see in the far left there, there's a zone that, that there is no pipe in that uh, area of the field. The farmer um, decided that that field area was not really appropriate to have tile in, so he chose not to put it there. Uh, but he designed the drainage system in this field so that he could uh, manage the water. If this had 
have been a very flat field, uh, all of the pipe would have been laid out um, parallel to one another all the way across the longest lengths of that field. When you look at the diagram to the right and below, uh, you know, we see that you know, the drain depth and the drain spacing uh, are important characteristics of how we drain and it can be dependent on the soil types and, and uh, um, how the farmer uh, wants to try to manage the water uh, from that field. Um, and uh, uh, these are considerations that, uh, that we take into consideration when laying out systems. So the question is, is that when we have uh, you know, a, a drainage system in a field, we know that water is the driving force. So the question that we have to arrive at is, is when does the drainage occur? And this is just sort of an introductory slide. I've got two more to, to follow up with this to compare and contrast uh, sort of the spatial and regional differences that we have within this project and, and how that might uh, be coupled for anybody uh, who's listening and participating today uh, in thinking about these types of things related to drainage. So just a description of this, uh, this figure on the right. So the, the, the solid line on that graph basically represents the monthly precipitation um, that we get here in Lamberton, Minnesota. Uh, you can see it increases dramatically in March and April to peak out in July, uh, and then it, uh, it falls off. When you look at that next line, the dashed line, uh, which is the highest line on the graph, that is our evapotranspiration line. And that, uh, early in the season, starts out fairly low, as one might imagine, and then as uh, evaporation uh, starts to take place on some of our, our farm fields when there's not a crop growing or the crop is very small, uh, evaporation is the dominant process that's occurring. And then as we go through the season and the crops grow, of course, and the canopies close, um, transpiration takes over so that you see the maximum amount of transpiration by the crop uh, occurring in August. And then, of course, as those crops senesce, um, that falls off um, as, as it does. The, the next highest line in there that peaks in June is the subsurface drainage uh, flow that we have. Uh, and then you can see that it starts to pick up in March and April and then really picks up in May, uh, peaks in June, and then falls off dramatically in July, uh, of course, as the crop has gotten growing. And uh, um, then we see the surface runoff. Now, the, some of this data, the surface runoff is modeled, but the idea here is, is that in these patterns, we see some areas early and late in the growing season where we may have some surplus water in the soil profile. Um, unfortunately, the crop's not usually growing then. Um, and then we run into a deficit condition. So the surplus period is ordinarily when we think about in some of these regions uh, where we need to drain uh, in order to make trafficable conditions and, and aerate the soil profile for the crop. However, we can run into trouble later in the season with not having enough water uh, to optimize crop production. So part of our concept here with controlled and managed drainage is to, to drain what we need to during the surplus periods, but then try to retain uh, and conserve water in the profile to try to overcome some of that deficit that we might see uh, later on in the growing season. So the next two slides, as I said, this is uh, some comparing and contrasting uh, of, of the, the east end and the west end, uh, if you will, of, of some of the areas of the Corn Belt. So this is the percent of the annual precipitation and drain flow for here in, in southwestern Minnesota. Uh, the blue bars represent the, uh, the precipitation, and you can see you know, about 14-15% uh, of our precip comes uh, during June, and you can see that nice uh, shape there. Uh, but about 90% of our annual drain flow occurs in April, May, June, and July, with the majority of it occurring in May and June. In contrast to that, you look at uh, some data from Indiana, and <clears throat> you can tell from the two slides that their precipitation regime is different than what we see in, in sort of the western part of the Corn Belt, um, as well as the, when their drain flow occurs. So their drainage primarily occurs between November and April during the non-growing season, when about 80% of that flow occurs. And of course, um, as I said, you know, for us here in the, the western part of the Corn Belt, uh, it, it more occurs, the drainage occurs during the, the growing season. So we need to be thinking about managing our drainage systems and managing the water um, somewhat differently, perhaps, as we go from, from region to region. 
This is a, a, a very new uh, diagram uh, that our group has started to use. It's, it's somewhat um, uh, unpolished and incomplete at this time, but it gives a, a relatively good representation of how we might think about managed and controlled drainage. So the blue bars represent uh, the areas where we would be thinking about where do we want to manage the water uh, out in the field. So during the January to April and the November through January period, we want to try to manage the water if it's available uh, relatively high in the soil profile. This helps um, sequester and, and store water in the soil that might be available later on uh, during other parts of the year. And it also can minimize the loss of, of dissolved nutrients like nitrate, uh, particularly in locations in, like Indiana and Ohio, where the majority of their drain flow happens during that non-growing season period. Um, then you can look at that planting season, April and May, where we like to see the water level be relatively low, aerate the profile, warm it up, and get the crop growing. And then as that transpiration uh, of the plant and the growth becomes very rapid, it increases, we want to try to elevate the level of the water in the profile um, to maximize the amount of water uptake for the crop and increase the water use efficiency and nutrient use efficiencies that occur out there. And then late in the season when uh, harvest occurs, if there's enough water out there that needs to be managed, we want to drop it, uh, drop the system back down. So the next uh, several slides I'm going to go through quickly um, are going to be some of our findings and recommendations as part of this project. So considering site characteristics, um, it's a site-by-site, it's site, site-specific kind of an idea uh, that people need to think about. Um, Generally, we like to see relatively flat landscapes, so 1% uh, to less than half of a percent. So these are almost tabletop flat fields, so it's not appropriate everywhere. Um, as I said earlier with the inset diagram that you have there, there's a relatively flat field, but, and it has a uniform slope, which allows us to pattern tile it in such a way that we can use control drainage in that field. So depending on how the, the, the timing uh, and the landscape characteristics, we need to be considering how we actually manage the systems and design them uh, appropriately uh, for a specific location. The next couple of slides are thinking about that growing season water. And the, the initial thing that I'll say here quickly is, is that when we think about this, we need to think about the fact that this practice, control drainage, managed drainage, works really well when we have water available to manage. So when we have water available to manage, this type of a practice can retain water that might be potentially available to the crop later in the growing season. Um, however, uh, it's not a guarantee that that will actually happen. We also need to be looking at how the water comes, because in some situations, uh, and we have seen this here in Minnesota, that um, Managing these systems actively is important. When we have excess water, 2010 was an extremely wet year uh, here in Minnesota. We didn't manage our drainage system well enough, and uh, our yields were lower uh, where we had control drainage versus where we had our conventional free drainage uh, by about six bushels per acre. So it was very important uh, for the farmer to learn um, how to manage uh, that water uh, to optimize uh, the crop production on those fields. Of course, one of the things that uh, we do see across all of our sites um, that we feel very comfortable with uh, in terms of our findings and recommendations is, is that this practice uh, year in and year out does reduce uh, nitrate, so it is a benefit to water quality. Um, what we do see, though, is, is that the result of the decrease in the loads of nitrogen um, are mainly due to decreases in drain flow, so the decrease in volume of water leaving the field because the water is conserved in the soil profile rather than leaving the field through the pipe. Um, and generally, we don't see big differences in nitrate concentration uh, coming out of uh, these fields. And then finally, when we think about yield, um, the group of us have been working together for, oh, probably 10 years. And, and a lot of our experience would suggest that you know, a person should not solely adopt a practice like this just because of the potential yield benefit. Um, Oftentimes, in, in many years, our, our, our yields can be neutral to slightly positive. Again, we can have situations where we could have negative yields, um, but that depends on, on the management and the available water uh, that is out there. And that's all I have. So 
I'll take any questions if we have a little bit of time. Yeah, um, I think we have a couple here. Does the evapotranspiration line show um, that you have on there with or without cover crops? Okay, so yeah, so this, so one of the things that um, uh, this is without a cover crop, okay, and, and one of the things that everybody needs to kind of be aware of that maybe we haven't emphasized is is that um, not every one of the projects have the same treatment. So the the projects that I, for example, worked on. Um, we're just looking at drainage and drainage water management kinds of things. Um, we didn't have control or we didn't have cover crops um, specifically here in, in, in the site that I worked on in Minnesota. So that data was, was just without a cover crop. Um, the next question is, would the theory be that with cover crops, that line may be closer to the surplus line during March, April, and early May? Well, I could hypothesize. I, I think that um, uh, you know when you when you look at the the early part of the season, the surplus level uh, probably would be uh, lower, uh, just because of the fact of depending on how you're managing that cover crop, uh, it will be growing and using water. Um, you know, Eileen would be the best one to answer this question since you've got more experience than I do. But um, you know, managing a cover crop properly so that you don't negatively impact the following crop. Uh, for for a water deficit would be important when you're managing a cover crop, I guess is the best thing to say. Okay. How optimistic are you about controlled drainage as a nitrogen loss mitigation strategy given the slope constraints and lack of yield benefit? Well, Mitch, I, I see your question. I, I think it's a great question. And I think that a person needs to keep in mind um, that a practice like controlled drainage, uh, managed drainage, is a tool in the toolbox. It's not unlike thinking about trying to use a cover crop or bioreactors or some of these other systems. One size doesn't fit all. Um, many locations, fields themselves, are, are going to be site specific. Um, so some fields that have too much slope to them, it may be much more appropriate to be planting cover crops for reducing nitrogen and maybe reducing water. Uh, there, um, of course, you're not going to necessarily be able to possibly have the benefit of conserving the water there by a structure um, uh, like we have in some of these systems. So, you know, there are certainly constraints, but keep in mind it's, it's more of a treatment train for considering water quality. Um, again, the, the lack of the yield benefit, um, it, it, it's, it's not something that a, I would prescribe that a farmer think of to Im implement a practice like this solely because of the potential for a yield benefit. It, it definitely has um, potential there, but we've seen more more benefit from the water quality aspect um, than seeing these uh, higher yields uh, for our systems that we've worked with. All right. Thank you, Jeff. And our next speaker is Joe Lauer from the University of Wisconsin. He will cover extended crop rotations. Joe is a corn extension agronomist at the University of Wisconsin, where he is responsible for developing education programs and materials for Wisconsin farmers and industry. Emphasis is on impact of cropping practices on grower profitability, the environment, and natural resource conservation. So Joe, go ahead. OK, thank you, Jan. Can you hear me? Yes, very good. Okay, all right, very good. All right, well, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, I was uh, uh, tasked to talk about some of the extended rotation uh, work that we've done as part of this uh, cropping systems uh, coordinated agricultural project. And and I want to first of all just highlight all the other people that are involved, especially the students, uh, Maychek Kazula, uh, a number of people from Illinois. Uh, they're the ones that have really done a lot of the work uh, for um, for this. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Then um, I want to just start with um, the uh, this idea of uh, crop rotation and and uh, and basically try to get across the point that it's a relatively uh, new system. Um, when uh, some of the earliest uh, 
uh, ways that we did agriculture was typically uh, kind of a slash and burn. We'd, we'd oftentimes go into an area crop and once it's played out, we'd move on to other things and, and other other places. And, and um, some of the earliest, uh, you know, documented things are things like Thomas Jefferson where he was trying to develop a crop rotation for his farm. Of course, what's dominating the U.S. corn uh, uh, cropping system, right, or U.S. cropping systems right now, is the corn soybean system uh, within the US, within the corn belt. And if you think about it, it's a relatively young system um, compared to like the rice systems of the Far East, where they've been in place for 500 plus years, or the or the wheat barley systems of the Middle East, which have been in place for a couple of millennia. The corn soybean system is really relatively young. And there's a lot of questions out there as to whether or not the uh, uh, this corn bean rotation can be sustainable in the long run. And we're starting to see some evidence that, uh, at least around the edges a little bit, um, that it might be um, it might be somewhat challenged. Uh, we're seeing a lot of weed resistance develop, pest resistance, uh, that sort of a thing develop with um, with this. And the fact that soybeans have kind of Plateaued in terms of their yield um, is, is kind of another factor uh, for this. Uh, this next slide here kind of describes what's just gives you the, the relative uh, change that's been going on uh, within the U.S. Corn Belt. What I did with these slides or these maps was by county I added up all of the field crop and vegetable land and then uh, calculated just the corn soybean proportion of that land. And you can see uh, basically anything in red is, um, is uh, 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 um, basically 90 to 100 percent of that area is in the corn, corn bean land. And uh, uh, so you can see in the 1970s here, uh, there's only a few, oops, I'm sliding around here, there's only a few counties in Illinois that were 90 to 100 percent. In the 1980s, um, there were a few more counties. Uh, Northern Iowa, there started to sh have some show up. Then in the 1990s, we saw more and more of these counties showing up that had 90 to 100 percent of the land in corn and beans. And then in the 2000s, uh, again, quite a bit more. And then where we're at today is, um, and this is just the f uh, five years through the uh, 2010s, you can see that a lot of land now is in this very tight rotation involving corn and soybean, where within a county, 90 to 100 percent of that land is in corn and beans. So this is relatively recent. It's only about a really 20, 30 year change that's a, that that has happened, where we're in this into this tight rotation. And, um, and again, there's just a lot of questions about uh, you know how sustainable this is going to be down the road. One of the things about the rotation effect is we really don't know what it is. Everyone uses it to their advantage, um, and it's really been very proven. We can usually increase crop yields with it. Some years it's basically a wash between rotated and continuous cropping, but, but many times uh, there is an advantage with, with growing uh, rotated uh, crops. We know what it isn't. Uh, it's not due to N. It's not due to pests, it's not due to alleopathy and, and things like that. The mechanism, though, for this effect is really unknown. There's really kind of three hypotheses out there. One is that there's a, a direct effect that, as Eileen was talking a little bit earlier about alleopathy or something that directly acts on the crop, there's an indirect effect where something basically acts on something else within the soil that um, uh, basically allows a crop, res uh, a crop response. And then there's another hypothesis where it's basically multi-environment. In other words, the environment dictates kind of what is going to be expressed or what problem is going to be expressed that particular year. And could, so it could be multiple different factors. But these are all hypotheses that are out there, and, and we really don't know what, uh, what uh, any one of those, uh, which it, what any one of those might be. So what I want to do now for the next little bit is just kind of uh, talk a little bit specifically about uh, what our part of this project was, and, and uh, it was a lot had a lot to do with greenhouse gas emissions and also some soil characteristics. And we'll talk about those, but I want to make sure that everyone is aware of what the crop rotation effect is out there and some of the 
options and and, uh, and when we add another crop into this rotation, what does that all mean? And I'm going to start uh, with this slide here, basically highlighting Wisconsin and Illinois, really. Um, we've got, a, and, and there's other examples, too. I know Iowa's got a whole bunch of what I would just call long-term cropping systems. Sometimes we have, um, uh, you know, trials that uh, were conducted, you know, in 1966 or there's some soils trials in Wisconsin in 1958 that were started. These are well-established, long-term experiments that are very equilibrated. They're replicated, and they've been basically having the same tillage and, and rotation treatments on these things for, for years. Uh, in Illinois, uh, you know, those, ex those experiments were started in 1996. Wisconsin, we have some in started in 1983. And, and then, and then also in 2002. But I'm going to talk really about about three of these uh, experiments here, and uh, just to give you a sense of what this rotation effect is, and and uh, the kind of response that that we can see from it. And especially when when uh, environments are changing or economics are 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 not very conducive for growing crops, crop rotation is a fundamental. A decision that can oftentimes influence yield anywhere from 10 to 18 or 19 percent yield increases by just rotating that crop out there. So we'll start with uh, an experiment that we started in 1983. This basically has 14 different uh, rotation sequences in it. The first one here is continuous corn, where we basically over a 10-year period. This is this is actually over 30 years of work now, but. But every uh, cycle takes about 10 years to complete. Uh, and every year we grow corn. And then in the second rotation, we have uh, every year we're growing soybeans. And then in the a third uh, rotation, what we're looking at is the corn-soybean rotation, where it takes two treatments and two years to basically have complete a cycle and grow every phase in every year. And, uh, uh, and then we've got finally the last 10 uh, treatments where we grow five years of corn and then five years of beans where, again, every phase is grown in every year. So these 10 treatments here, uh, treatments 5 through 14, are basically treatments that uh, we have kind of a rotation within a rotation. We'll grow five years of beans and then five years of corn. And we can look at the effect of what that first, second, and third year of corn, for example, does after growing five years of beans. And uh, again, it's kind of a rotation within a rotation kind of experiment. So I'll do this one first, and then I'm going to jump into the extended rotations and some of the data that we see with adding a third crop. So this is the uh, typical response that we see uh, along the bottom here is the uh, is the uh, different rotations that we've got. So this one here is going to be first year corn following five years of beans. And then we'll grow second year corn, third year corn, and so on. On the right here is continuous corn. And I'm only showing here uh, the last 20 years of data. But remember, this experiment started in 1983. So this continuous corn treatment here has really been in place for over 30 years. And then on the left here is the corn-soybean rotation. These letters here indicate that uh, the treatments are statistically different from one another. So in this case here, the corn soybean and the first year corn treatments are basically yielding the same. There's really no difference there. These numbers down here, the 16% and 18%, are the response of that particular rotation uh, compared to continuous corn uh, way over here. Okay, so in this case here, uh, rotating corn increases yield 16% over that of continuous corn. All right, so all the slides are going to be basically kind of set up in the same way, so you can look for the rotation effect, rotation that treatment on the bottom, and then the yield response on the on the y-axis. Now, what, one of the things that we see right away is that first-year corn following five years of beans basically yields the same as corn in a corn-soybean rotation. There's really no difference there. As we go to that second year of corn, we see a yield decrease that that occurs but it's still 5% better than continuous corn. And then when we go to that third year of corn following five years of beans, we see that uh, that yield is basically no different than 
the continuous corn yield uh, after 30 years. So what this slide is saying basically is that it, the rotation effect lasts at most two years, and by the third year you're basically growing corn at continuous corn yield levels of 30 years or more. Now way over on the right here is some, some information on conventional till and no-till, and what we see in Wisconsin is over the last 20 years, that the conventional till will typically, and in corn will typically out yield no till by about six bushels to the acre. So that's uh, the corn rotation uh, response that we see. On the soybean side, the story is a little different. Again, the slide is set up the same way. Yield is uh, on the y axis here. We've got the different rotations. And remember, this is first year soybeans following five years of corn. The difference here is that when we have that long break of five years, that first year of soybeans actually yields higher or better than uh, soybeans in a corn-soybean rotation where we're growing, uh, rota rotating that corn annually. The second year of soybeans basically yields the same as uh, soybeans in a corn-soybean rotation. And then it goes down further in the third and fourth year. And by that fifth year, we're basically at continuous soybean yields. And remember, this soybean yield uh, level here is over 30 years of continuous soybeans, okay? And again, what we're really showing is about uh, 20 years of, um, of data for this particular treatment here. Okay, and when we look at the tillage part of this, what we see is that the actually the no-till beans out-yield the conventional till beans in this particular location. Now, one of the things that we have going on within this trial is, is cis nematode. And whenever you do tillage, you're carrying those cysts around and, and, uh, and moving that cyst around. And so we, we, we do see a response, uh, with, uh, in this particular location with, with no-till. Uh, no-till is, uh, usually better yielding for soybeans than, than, uh, con than conventional till. Okay, now, so well, we, we see this uh, typically, and, um, and, and basically what I want to concentrate on now is this break year. Uh, if there's only a, a one-year break in the rotation, then that second corn phase is basically equivalent to continuous corn. So along the bottom here, we've got a number of different rotations, two years of corn, one-year beans, three years of corn, one-year beans, and then continuous corn way over on the right, and then the corn-soybean rotation on the left. But you can see that this that by the uh, second year of corn in a corn-corn-soybean rotation and a corn-corn-corn-soybean rotation, that yield is basically the same as uh, continuous corn, okay? And that, so you need to have more than one year to really take advantage in that second year, uh, one, one break year, to take advantage of that second year of corn. When we do have treatments that have a little bit longer rotation, like uh, some of these right here where we've got corn, corn, oats, uh, and then two years of alfalfa, or corn, soybean, corn, oats, and two years of alfalfa, or three years corn, two years of alfalfa. What we'll oftentimes see in that second year of corn is a yield advantage over that of continuous corn. We see it in, the, uh, in, in this rotation here as well as this rotation, and then uh, we don't quite see it as much we see it a little bit here yet in this uh, three years of corn, two years of, of oats and alfalfa rotation. So at least two break years are needed to measure a response in that second corn phase compared to continuous corn. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so what happens then when we start to extend that rotation a little bit? And in this particular project, the, the, the uh, crop that we were trying to bring into the uh, experiment was wheat. And basically what we see, and this is data from Arlington, uh, basically what we see is that whenever you can add that third, uh, third crop, you basically improve the grain yield of all the crops that are out there. Uh, in, in, this, um, uh, in this chart here, you can see continuous corn was uh, uh, lower yielding than when we had the three crops in the rotation. Okay, and likewise with soybeans, the same thing happened. And then with wheat, uh, whenever we were able to bring in uh, that third, have that third crop, we, we were able to take advantage of it. There is a little bit of an effect on the order of those three crops. The uh, corn, soybean, wheat rotation, at least in this experiment, did a little bit better 
than corn in a, in a corn-wheat soybean rotation. So the sequence of the crops seems to make a little bit of difference as far as uh, where you put that, that third crop. This is data from Arlington. Um, uh, this is the, uh, let's see here. This is the uh, data then from uh, Monmouth, Illinois, that Emerson Nafsinger has. And basically, uh, again, we see this, this kind of response that goes on here uh, with, with uh, uh, adding that third crop. All the crops basically are improved. What Emerson also has in this particular uh, experiment is a tillage effect. And what he's seeing is that tillage increases corn grain yield in all of these rotations. Um, okay, not very much, uh, but there is a little bit of an advantage statistically that we can pick up when we look at the uh, almost 18 years of uh, data that's been collected in Monmouth. And the same thing uh, is, is seen at Perry. Again, we see oftentimes the addition of that third crop is beneficial to the corn crop and um, uh, slightly more beneficial. and. Uh, and oftentimes tillage will increase that for corn uh, for corn grain yield. This is contrasted, though, with what we see at Wisconsin. Uh, in Wisconsin, uh, typically what we'll see is an interaction that occurs with the uh, corn-soybean rotation and tillage. And that interaction is is here. When we when we grow that first year of corn. Uh, whether we rotate, we, we see the same rotation response, but we don't see any difference at all due to tillage in that first year of corn following five years of beans. We see that in this rotation here as well as in the corn and the corn-soybean rotation. Uh, there's really no difference between tilled and no-tilled uh, corn in, in, um, in that. But as you go deeper into the rotation, you start to see more and more of a yield advantage with tillage. And this is what we mean by the tillage uh, rotation interaction for corn. Uh, it doesn't really affect corn in the corn soybean rotation and first year corn, but it does improve yield in second to through fifth year corn and continuous corn. So there might be economic situations where uh, conventional tillage might be important. And uh, so I always tell growers, don't throw away your chisel plow. There might be some reasons to do a little bit more tillage. But whenever you can no-till, there really seems to be an advantage with corn. The soybean story is a little different, though, again. Uh, the soybean story, basically, we always see a yield advantage with no-till, uh, regardless of where we're at with rotation, except in this treatment over here where we've grown uh, continuous soybeans for 30-plus years. So that's a little bit of a, a difference between what we see and at Arlington in Wisconsin versus what Emerson is seeing in, in Illinois. And again, remember that with this trial, we do have some cis nematode uh, problems with, uh, with this on the soybean side, at least. OK, so this then brings us, so that's kind of the rotation effect and what's going on there. What I'd like to do now is just share with you the findings that we've seen for some of the greenhouse gas emissions that, that we um, have measured uh, over time. And on the left here, we've got the Arling or the uh, the uh, Wisconsin data. On the uh, right here, we've got the uh, uh, Illinois data. And one of the things that stands out to me, at least, is that there are specific periods during the growing season when we have a lot of nitrous oxide emissions. Nothing new there, uh, but um, uh, there are usually in the spring of the year or following a rain event, we'll typically have a lot of um, a lot of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Also, uh, when we have a drought like we saw in 2012, there are not nearly as many uh, nitrous oxide emissions as there are in a more wet year uh, in, in 2013. So weather and season has a, has a pretty major uh, difference in, in terms of uh, uh, how, many, how much emissions are going to occur. And we saw this both at Illinois as well as in, in, in Wisconsin. One of the things that we have seen as well is that uh, the, the, the amount of uh, uh, emissions that come off uh, is really a function of the rotation. And while we see more, we see more gas emissions with continuous corn than we do with corn soybean or corn soybean wheat. 
Uh, actually, the emissions from corn soybean and corn soybean wheat are fairly comparable, and it's the corn soybean, uh, and it's a continuous corn emissions that tend to be quite a bit higher than um, um, uh, than, than the other than the other cropping systems. And finally, we do uh, measure um, changes in soil characteristics due to due to uh, 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 cropping system. Uh, generally, the uh, uh, water content um, of continuous corn is is uh, falls off at a different rate or different uh, is at a different level than it is for the corn soybean and the corn soybean wheat rotations. So that we we have been able to pick these up again. These are well established experiments that have been in place for a long period of time, and we are picking these this up as well as changes in soil organic carbon uh, as well too. So to kind of uh, summarize things here a little bit, one of the things that we're seeing is that uh, the modern corn hybrids and management practices, we've changed these as we've gone through time, of course, but we still see that same rotation response as we did back when we started the experiment, the older hybrids and practices that we had back then. This rotation effect lasts at most two years, increasing grain yield 10 to 18 percent for the first year of corn and 0 to 9 percent for that second year of corn. And if you want to see a response in that second year of corn, um, you need at least two break years or more to see a response in that second year. Um, tillage, what we see is it's somewhat site specific, but we do not, uh, does not really affect corn yield that first year following soybean. Even in Emerson's data in Illinois, it's a relatively small response, uh, but it really improves our corn yield as you go uh, further into that rotation of continuous corn, that second year of continuous corn, and third year, 6 to 9% yield increases. The addition of other crops to the rotation can improve grain yield of all the crops. It's probably the prudent thing to do. The real problem or challenge is how do you market? Where do you market that third crop? And that's always been uh, kind of the issue. We're good at handling two crops in the, in the U.S. Corn Belt, but not necessarily that, that third crop very, very easily. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions can be mitigated by uh, extended crop rotations. We do see it go down compared to continuous corn, and, uh, and that's uh, something that we measure with this project. And there is a, this rotation effect, and it's probably unique from field to field and also season to season. We have some years where we really don't see a lot of yield um, impact. In other words, everything we do out there in, a, in an environment does well, whether we grow continuous corn or not. But whenever we have stress, um, generally that rotation effect is going to be the better uh, decision to make out there. And then these long-term experiments, I think, are giving us a preview of crop rotations in, in the future. Um, I think that these, these experiments, um, administratively, they're hard to keep going, but I think they're really important, especially as we start to look at some of these long-term effects that are important for greenhouse gas emissions and carbon sequestration and, and those kinds of things. With that, I'll stop, and I don't know if there's any time for any questions yet, but um, if there is, I'll be happy to take them. This is our contact information here, and uh, you can follow us as we go through the seasons uh, every year. So, Jan, I'll turn it back to you. Okay. Um, we are out of time for questions, so we'll have to save those to the end. Okay. And our last presentation is from J.R. Buckle. He is from Iowa State. He will explain the topics of farmer adaptation and conservation practice adoption. Jay is an extension sociology, sociologist and a co-director of the Iowa Farm and Rural Life Poll, an annual survey of Iowa farmers. His research and extension efforts focus on improving the environmental and social performance of agricultural systems, emphasizing soil and water quality. So Jay, go ahead. Okay, thanks, Jan. I'd also like to mention that I'm sitting here with my co-conspirator, Jamie Benning, who's the uh, Water Quality Coordinator for Iowa State University Extension, uh, but who was the Extension Coordinator for the Corn Cap Project or the Sustainable Corn Project for several years, I guess, for three years, Jamie? Yes. Yeah. So, so she'll be, I'll be presenting quite a bit of information from our survey and in-depth interviews, and then she'll be uh, presenting on a piece of the research that she is going to be using as a stepping off point for her dissertation research, which she's starting pretty much right now. Okay, so 
I'll just jump right into it. The uh, CSCAP was Sustainable Corn Social Science Research. It was a, a pretty big chunk of uh, our project, I thought. Um, and so really, what did we set out to do? Well, um, the basic gist of it, or the rationale for it, is that climate change poses threats to agriculture and will require adaptation by farmers. But as we set out in 2011, starting up a project, we really didn't know very much about farmers' perspectives on on, uh, on climate change. And so it was really important to understand both about what farmers thought about climate change and adaptation, and also advisors' perspectives to some extent. So the groups that we want to engage, you really need to understand where they're at if you want to engage with them and uh, have effective outreach. So the basic model that, that drove our social science research was that, you know, first you have to understand what police, what police systems are, what people's belief systems are. Uh, those belief systems tend to be related to and drive attitudes and risk perceptions, and uh, then risk perceptions are associated with behavior change. So, of course, you know, if you don't, uh, if people don't feel uh, uncomfortable, uh, they generally don't change, or they don't see a risk in, in lack of change, and they don't, generally don't change. So that was kind of a very bare bones basis for our research. Um, so we wanted to know what do farmers believe about climate change? Are they concerned about increasing weather variability? Uh, do they support action? Do they think they should change the way they farm? Do they think that universities and farm groups and government agencies and different other ag stakeholders should help them change and adapt to increasing weather variability? So in order to do that, we did a couple things. First off, we did a farmer survey, and it turned out to be a really large farmer survey. Uh, we had actually proposed a fairly small one of just a couple states, but then we learned that Linda Procopy and the Useful to Usable project, which was a similar project out of Purdue, had also proposed a survey, and so we got together and decided to pool our funds and ended up being able to do a much larger survey. We uh, surveyed larger scale farmers, about $100,000 of gross revenue and up, and that represents about 80% of the farmland in, in the region that you see those shaded regions that you see. Uh, we stratified the sample by 22 hydrologic unit code 6 watersheds across the corn belt, and that represents about 60% of U.S. corn production. And uh, USDA, National Agricultural Statistics Service, who, which is the agency that conducts the ag census, did the survey for us back in February 2012. And we ended up surveying 4,778 farmers. So, um, all right, I forgot to mention, we also did some, some in-depth interviews, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So what have we learned? Well, uh, we started out with the belief question, and I uh, wanted to know what do farmers think about climate change. And what we found was that most farmers do believe that climate change is happening, but a minority associate it with human activity. So if you could see the, the upper box there, climate change is occurring and caused mostly by human activity. About 8% of farmers put themselves in that category. Climate change is occurring and caused more or less equally by natural changes in human activities, about 33%, so that was the largest category. And then climate change is occurring and it's caused mostly by natural changes in the environment, in the environment about a quarter of farmers put themselves in there. And then there was a pretty large group of farmers that uh, believe that there's not enough evidence yet to know with certainty, and then just 4% of farmers do not believe climate change is occurring at all. So as you can see in that lower box there, you know, about two-thirds of farmers uh, believe that climate change is occurring, but only about 40% believe that humans are at least partly responsible. And I'll come back to that in a minute, the implications of that in a couple of minutes. So the second area we looked at was risk perception. Uh, as I noted before, you know, risk perceptions are related to action. People generally don't act unless they be a risk of, act, of, of not acting uh, on any given uh, on any given issue. And so we gave basically looked at the literature, what the what the climate scientists are predicting for the Corn Belt in terms of you know the future future weather, future climate. Of course, they're predicting longer dry periods and drought. And uh, this actually turned out to be the the item on which most more farmers were concerned. About sixty percent concerned and very concerned. And I would point out that this question was this survey was done before the twenty twelve drought, before it really really got dry. Um, increased heat stress, heat stress on crops, about 50 percent, 52 percent concerned or very concerned there, and uh, more frequent extreme rains, about half, and as you can see on the other one, higher incidence of crop disease, 
increased weed pressure, about half the farmers concerned, very concerned, not slightly concerned, and very few were not concerned, except for you know, on that increased loss of nutrients in the waterways, about a third were concerned, very concerned, about 43% slightly, and then about a quarter not concerned. Hey, Jay. Yes. Jay, I'm going to interrupt you real quick. Is it possible for you to switch over to the handset? Uh, I actually don't have a handset. I'm on a cell phone, so I'll, I'll get a little closer. Mitch, yeah. Mitch, can you hear me a little bit better? I don't think this will be able to answer. Oh, he's typing. Okay, he's typing, so I'll just keep going. So, um, okay. okay, great. Thanks, Mitch, for letting us know that. Uh, climate concerns, one of the other findings is that climate concerns really varied by beliefs, which was very interesting. So this is, a, this is an example of uh, excess water issues, so more frequent extreme rain. Um, those that are concerned are very concerned. About half of farmers, as we saw before, were concerned are very concerned about that. But if you look at those farmers who believe that climate change is occurring and mostly due to human causes, about 60% were concerned are very concerned compared to those who I uh, do not believe that climate change is occurring in about 24%. So a really stark contrast uh, if you compare by belief structure about climate change. We also found that climate concerns vary across the region. So this is just an example, uh, but we mapped these by those, those Hub 6 watersheds, and you can probably, depending on where you are, you can probably find yourself on this map. Uh, this is longer dry periods and drought, and as you can see, uh, you know, out to the western uh, side of the Corn Belt where it tends to be drier, that's where those concerns were higher, um, except for down in southern Indiana where we also had some really uh, high, high levels of concern about dry periods and, and drought. But a pretty pretty big range across the region. Uh, this is concerns about more frequent extreme rain events, as you can see also, you know, as you might expect, the eastern Corn Belt, which is, tends to be a little bit wetter, uh, and has in recent years tended to get more extreme rain events. You can see the western Lake Erie was the highest. They were also the most concerned about the uh, loss of nutrients, as you might expect. And then over there in uh, Nebraska, much less concerned. Another really important finding was that a lot of farmers really do support action to help them prepare for increased weather variability. So we have a statement about, um, maybe, well, each of these statements said, for example, seed companies should develop crop varieties that are uh, adapted to increase weather variability. 84% of farmers agreed with that. Um, farmers should take additional steps to protect farmland. Uh, a lot of agreement with that as well. And um, university extension was in there. So a lot of a lot of support. Um, it looks as you can see here the, the support for state and federal uh, agency uh, to help farmers prepare was probably the lowest of that. Confidence, confidence and capacity to adapt was an important one. So these are three that look at different uh, you know, ways that farmers think about their, their capacity to adapt. I have the knowledge and technical skill to deal with any weather-related threat to the viability of my farm operation. Not quite half of farmers agreed with that. And a lot of uncertainty there. So there, what we found was a lot of farmers do have confidence in their capacity to adapt to the future, the future weather issues, but there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of farmers that don't feel uh, confident. And as you can see here, confidence as well varies across the region. Just about all of the, the variables vary depending on where you were. Um, another important piece, and for those of you who are extension folks tuning in, this is something that, uh, that I was, as an extension sociologist, happy to see. And this was just for Iowa, but we asked farmers uh, in the Iowa Farm and Real Life Poll who they trust most for climate change information, and University Extension came out way on top. Uh, you can see at the bottom there was the mainstream news media, not very much trusted, very distrusted, and radio talk show hosts as well, so that was an interesting finding. Um, we also, through the U2U project, uh, uh, surveyed ag advisors, um, so these are private sector like certified crop advisors and that sort of thing, and they also trust the extension most for information about climate change. Um, and then this is another one about Iowa farmers. Which group do you trust the most for information to help you make decisions about dealing with extreme weather, or drought, hail, or excess water? As you can see, ISU extension came out by a long shot. We're not sure you know, how this would translate across the region, but I have a feeling that, that, that extension, I think our university extension would come out pretty good. Oh, and this is uh, Jamie's. Sure. So to uh, characterize uh, 
the farmers that responded to uh, the initial survey, the, uh, the 4,778 farmers, um, ad um, adaptation practices uh, currently used as they responded to that survey in 2011. Uh, we looked at uh, adaptation uh, by different practices, so tile drainage, no-till, cover crops, and um, highly erodible land that is planted to crop. So if we look at um, to the far right, uh, farmers that responded um, that they used tile drainage, um, there were about 23% that used tile drainage on 100% of their land. Uh, and as we look at no-till, about 18% uh, um, had no-till on 100% of their acres. And uh, we take a look at cover crops. Now, think back, um, much of the cover crop um, uh, adoption has increased very rapidly over the past few years. So um, don't be discouraged by that number, but it looks like, uh, or for the response here, about 73% reported that they had cover crops on no um, acres. And um, the largest response was um, in that 1 to 40% of the land that they farm uh, at about 22% for cover crops. So um, this is just to characterize uh, those farmers that responded to the survey and uh, the, the type of practices that they had adopted and to what extent they were adopting them on their farms. And a lot of that is in Indiana. Yes. Uh, so I know this is a, a bit of a busy uh, figure here, but I want to draw your attention to the top uh, practices. So we're looking at those same practices of using artificial, artificial drainage uh, no-till, cover crops, and then planting to highly erodible land. And uh, we found that there were some correlations and positive relationships between um, using some of those practices and other practices and then other um, characteristics of their lands, of farmers' lands, and other um, experiences they had with um, on-farm experiences like flooding, erosion, um, saturated soil. Um, so to quickly highlight a few of these relationships, um, there were some negative um, uh, correlations between artificial drainage and cover crops and artificial drainage and planting to highly erodible land. And that, uh, you know, confirms what we expect, certainly about highly erodible land. We see our uh, artificially drained areas typically in our flatter soils, our uh, more poorly drained soils. So um, that confirms, uh, you know, a, a suspicion that we would have. Um, looking at no-till, um, we see positive correlations with um, cover crops and planting to highly erodible land. So looking at farmers that have concern um, with erosion, uh, having highly erodible land planted to row crops, there's a positive correlation with um, adopting no-till in those areas. And then also uh, no-till and cover crops complement each other in that management practice, um, facilitates uh, the, the no-till practice um, or the cover crop practice with no-till, and there is a positive correlation there as well. Uh, if we look at uh, some of the other uh, aspects, um, saturated soil, certainly a positive correlation there with a relationship with artificial drainage, um, a negative with no-till. Um, and uh, another one I thought was uh, very interesting, looking at cattle, there was a positive um, relationship with use of cover crops. So some of these implications or um, kind of jumping off points that we can look at for uh, extension um, and outreach that um, cattle producers are uh, an audience that may be uh, more receptive to using cover crops. They can use them as uh, a forage source. They typically are on more highly erodible land, more highly sloping land, and are concerned about soil loss. So um, that uh, implication there is that um, focusing on cattle producers, focusing on farmers that are um, planting areas of highly erodible land, and um, they might be more receptive to using cover crops. So we'll, um, in the future, be looking at another survey that was uh, administered to participating farmers um, that we worked with with the extension team. So each extension uh, specialist that worked with us um, from each participating state recruited about 20 uh, participating farmers. They took the survey as well uh, at the beginning of the project and then um, are just wrapping up the uh, post-project survey. And we'll look at some of these uh, relationships uh, and levels of adoption of practices and, and be analyzing uh, that data uh, very soon. Okay, thanks, Jane. I see that Jan has given us the hook, even though we, I don't know if we've got a full complement of minutes, but I'm going to move through this pretty quick. 
So Jay mentioned that we uh, had farmer groups, and we actually did in-depth interviews. Our extension educators did in-depth interviews with uh, participants in that farmer, those farmer groups. And I'm just going to share a few uh, of their, their quotes, but particularly about their their um, their uh, reasons for for adapting and adopting different practices. This is about climate change beliefs, but I'm going to skip through that to get more to the uh, motivations for adaptation. And so. And a lot of our farmers in our groups mentioned extreme weather events and risk perception. So uh, here's one. One of the worst times in this area is like when the ground is froze and we can get a big rain and the cover crops are peace of mind for that. So that's uh, one of the big things when uh, when you get a big rain and the ground is frozen or, or is just thawing up. Uh, there's another good quote here. Uh, this is one, uh, somebody who had just uh, started cover crops. Well, we had a neighbor that used to put rye on corny chops. And I kind of laughed, but then we had a winter where the frost went out the first went out the first part of February, and the top two inches thawed out, and then we had a heavy rain. And it started washing where there was nothing, and I didn't laugh anymore. I was like, we have to do something. So that's how we got started. And uh, here's another one. Actually, soil health was a really big uh, component of those motivations for for adapting, and this is kind of a representative quote: "The oats would die over the winter, so that you wouldn't have to spend any money on killing it off in the spring. And we have a lot less washing after we seed the oats." You get more microbial, microbial activity when you have that oats in there. The ground is really nice and mellow, and it's nice to plant in, uh, so you're going to get a yield boost from it. And so that's kind of a, the kind of quote that we, we, we got out of those interviews. Uh, so now it's time for questions. I'm just going to take half a minute and hear more, uh, just to, to say what have we learned well. They're diverse in their perspectives. They're concerned about the particular impacts of climate change. Um, most farmers think there should be more. And many farmers have combinations of practices in place, but they also, even those that have a combination of practices, believe they should do more if they're looking for help, although they are more supportive of extension and private sector than state or federal government. Um, a lot of confidence in that they'll be able to adapt, but a lot of uncertainty as well. Uh, so I think we have to really appeal to that confidence and in, in, in adaptive capacity when we're working with farmers. Um, and there's a lot of uncertainty out there. Um, I guess I don't really have time for the last slide, but I'll put it up there so people can can read on it. So, Jan, do you want to take over? Um, yeah, there's a comment or question. Is the legend mixed up on your slide from the 2011 Farm and Rural Life Poll on farmers' trust for climate change information? The colors of strongly uh -huh. and somewhat distrust seem mixed up. Oh, um, maybe. I'll have to look at that. But the, okay. but the, the distrust was on the left side of the axis, and the trust was on the right side. So maybe, yep. yeah, maybe the, uh, yeah, they might have been mixed up. Okay. Um, but the, the main point is that the, that the trust was on the right side and the distrust on the left. So thanks for thanks for noting that. All right. Uh, another one is: Did crop prices play a role in decision making? Yeah, for for adoption, you know, that did come out in some of the the in depth interviews. By the time by the time we were doing the interviews, you know, crop prices had pretty much plateaued, but there were definitely some comments about, you know, trade offs, uh, you know, making hay while the sun shines. Um, you know, there were a number of farmers that, that really talked about thinking hard about any sort of of practice that could result in a yield hit or could take land out of production. Uh, we have to remember the services 20, 2012, 2013. So crop prices were a lot stronger than they are, than they are now. So there was mention of that. Um, but I think at least uh, among our farmers, yeah, pretty much everybody was, was mentioned weather, extreme weather, soil health, but there's always balances, balancing with the economics. Thanks for that question, Hannah. All right. Um. You mentioned that discussion of climate change can be difficult because it's politicized, so it might be best to discuss weather variability mm -hmm. instead. Can you mm -hmm. elaborate on that? Yeah, so that that's goes back to that belief question. And so, you know, we found that two-thirds of farmers believe that climate change is occurring, but only 40% believe that it's due primarily or, or at least somewhat to human activity. And so what we've, you know, so we work a lot with, folks that are working with farmers directly um, and in audiences that, you know, a, a lot of folks that they're going to be working with do not necessarily believe that climate change is happening and, and more, more likely than not don't believe that it's due to human activity. 
Uh, so we strongly caution against, you know, folks at field days and, uh, well, not strongly, but caution against when you're at field days or workshops or what have you. It's not really necessary, we don't think, to talk about anthropogenic climate change or talk about man-made climate change. I mean, the, the, I think the, what we focus on primarily is adaptation to extreme weather, uh, just to try to avoid alienating, potentially alienating 60% of your audience off the bat. Um, and you kind of get to the same, to the same end, right? Because we're talking about adaptation to extreme weather events or, or, and what have you. And, uh, you know, it's the same conservation practices, whether it's man-made or, or due to natural activity. Uh, so, you know, for those that are working on the front lines, we, we, we suggest that it's not necessarily important to go to the, to the man-made climate change side of things. Yeah, keep it focused on managing water, managing soil, managing nutrients, uh, you know, keeping, uh, keeping those nutrients and soil in place in the field and, and really focus it around those kind of messages rather than um, causes, yeah. you know, keep the, the conversation productive and moving forward. Yeah, focus on solutions rather than causes. Okay, great. Um, okay. I guess we're, we're to the uh, question and answer period then. We have a, we're scheduled 10 minutes, so um, I don't know how we want to do that. If I just go back up to the questions that were earlier today, or what should I do? Or does somebody have any questions? Well, I certainly, um, I think for those who would like to remain on the phone call, since we are at the two-hour mark, um, can certainly address any remaining questions. Jan, that were up in the feed. I think there were a couple maybe on the cover crops and then um, maybe one that Joe wants to address on the wheat um, further as well. Or if people have questions that they would like to type in the chat box now can do that. And then as a reminder, if you would like to speak your question, you can unmute your line using star six. Okay. Um, I'll just go back to the top then. Uh, when planting and terminating, were insurance guidelines and NRCS deadlines considered for cover crops? Uh, Jan, I, I actually um, responded to several of those questions. In oh, okay. Box. Um, basically, it was a good question. Yes, somewhat. Um, um, not, I mean, not overly, but... Yes, we were aware that there are dead dates for those, and we were cognizant of those. And I cannot vouch that each of my colleagues in every state um, were within those, but I would say for the most part we were. Okay. Um, and the other, the other question that I responded to, there's too many here now. I can't remember. Um, go ahead. Uh, what factors led you to decide that the corn yield loss was due to allelopathy? Sorry. Uh, rather yeah. than nitrogen. Yeah, okay, so I, I, I typed a chat response to that and basically said, um, we did not conclude that it was allelopathy. We just said that the factors that were associated with the larger yields effect were consistent with that concept, but we don't really know for sure. Okay. Has anyone been paying attention to noxious weed seed content like cheatgrass that is common to cereal rye crops? So I would say that we recommend that only seed that has been cleaned be planted, that it, that it not be, that, that seed definitely needs to be cleaned. I do not um, know, personally I do not know enough about whether cleaning of cereal rye seed takes care of cheatgrass or not. That's beyond my area of expertise, but we definitely recommend that people plant only only uh, cleaned, cleaned seed. All right, thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions here for Joe. Uh, can one be given the links to the Wisconsin rotational maps? I'm sorry, Jan, I missed that. Those, the rotational maps that you had in your presentation, can those links be provided? Yeah, again, I, I responded on the text to, uh, yes, I can. There, there's actually going to be an update in the data in February in about, in about a week, and I should have those updated uh, through 2015 uh, by March 1st. Okay. Um, 
And do you have information on on wheat yields without mm -hmm. crop rotation? Yeah, the question was about continuous wheat, and, and our experiment at Arlington has had 15 or 16 years now of continuous wheat, and that's on slide number 13. Basically, the yield of wheat is about half that of uh, rotated wheat. All right. Um, it looks like there's a comment that says that if the seed is labeled as pure live seed, that will address the weed seed question. And are there any other questions? If not, then I guess I just want to say thank you to everybody for taking time to participate in this webinar. Question and the questions and answers as well as the webinar re recording will be posted on the website. Thank you. And one final comment as well, Jan, just to um, tag on, that I posted the form link or the website address. If you would like to apply for um, continuing education credits, please go to that website, and then you'll find a link um, to the form to submit, and then um, just complete those few um, entry points, and then we'll get it submitted. Thank you. And thanks, Jan, and the speakers for your um, contributions today. This will end the webinar proceedings.